so we'll be uh, i'll be just sharing my screen so is the screen uh, visible and am i audible clearly yes yes audible i can i can hear i can see the screen also so uh, thank you uh, first of all i'll pay my regards to dhani sir uh, for actually taking his time out of his vacation and more uh, and continuing to moderate the session so this is a very important topic as sir said because uh, we day in day out uh, deal with this topic and i think n number of presentations will not be sufficient to justify because this is something which is a little volatile uh, we it it comes up with experience uh, and uh, uh more or less uh, it with experience you tend to find and refine your concepts surrounding the 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 this mood and emotions and effect domain of mental studies examination what i have tried to done uh, do here is i've just tried to go through the basics of like what exactly we mean by them the subtle differences and i have tried to stick on to this group discussion uh now uh, with various domains of uh, presentation which we give in our mental studies examination uh, the the various adjectives which we use and the terminology the definitions and maybe we can discuss over it because this needs vivid discussion this topic this is something which is not very concrete uh, uh, in in sync with other psychiatric presentations so so uh, and it, it it so it needs more clarity more discussion so anyone who doesn't find it uh have difficulty can actually uh, uh, stop in between can actually ask any question in between the presentation so because it's a group discussion so it will be more beneficial i'm starting here with the, this vignet by uh, the a patient of emil kreplin i actually got this in a book uh, so i wish to inform you the slides are moving right yes yes they are moving fine uh, i wish to inform you that i have received the cake many thanks but i am not worthy i you send it on the anniversary of my child's death for i am not worthy of my birthday i must weep myself to death i cannot live and i cannot die because i have failed so much i shall bring my husband and children to hell we all are lost we won't see each other any more i shall go to the convict person and to and my two girls as well if they do not make away with themselves because they were born in my body so you can see a uh, negative uh, emotion in reflecting in this verbatim or maybe a negative effect so what is a emotion so as per the casey and kelly is fish psychopathology they are the editors of fish psychopathology and casey and kelly and why fish psychopathology is important it's promoted by royal college of physicians which is a very very prestigious uh, institute so as per fish psychopathology emotion is a stirred up state caused by physiological changes occurring as a response to some event and which tends to maintain or abolish the causative element so emotion is something which is stirred up which is uh, locked to any event so it's in time based it's in it's a temporal kind of a phenomena so emotion is uh, always locked to some event and it is more i would say transient feeling is something which is defined as positive and negative reaction to an experience or event and is a experiential aspect of the emotion so what we feel uh, is a feeling so the experiential aspect of that emotion the emotion which is stirred up by some event so whatever it experiences it gives us uh, that experience is known as feeling oi bode oi bode is sims so 2018 version of sims says it is marked but transitory so feelings are always transitory and when we talk about emotions ekman and frizen six basic emotions so anger happiness surprise disgust sadness and fear so these were the six basic emotions so when we talk about uh, emotions emotions we said that it was transitory locked to an event mood 
and contrary is a pervasive and sustained uh, uh, phenomena that colors the pers person's perception of the world. So it is something which is in the background and which is more sustained. And it is it 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 it's colors the way we see the world as per the fish, as per the Sims Oibode, the mood describes the state of the self in relation to its environment. So it is basically in relation to our environment, how we describe our self is the mood. Mood is objectless. Objectless means it is not actually locked to any event around or any specific. Uh, a uh, person or any object around and it can be uh, described again as a formless background against which we live our lives. Jansen and Norgard has a, given a very good book for psychiatric interviewing, so I've taken it from there. So mood is also not an isolated mental object. So it is not something that we can isolate, key, okay, this is a mood and we can study it from a corner or, 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 or from a distance. So it is something which is pervasive, it is a background, and it is it is more broader and at times during an interview we cannot maybe assess what the mood is because because of its pervasiveness and it may be more long lasting less differentiated and non intentional so this is and again without object so this is what the mood is so when we say ki is there any difference in between mood and emotion so I have actually explained in my last, in the, in the previous two slides, the same thing. When we say emotions, they are caused by specific events because I'm repeating it because it is important. Very brief in duration, specific and numerous in nature. Like there, are many, there can be many specific emotions and usually accompanied by distinct facial expressions. So whatever we come across momentarily, we be very brief interviewing with the patient. Actually, we come across the, if, if at all, the emotions. The mood is actually general, uh, general and unclear. It, la it, lost long it lasts longer than the emotions, maybe hours or days. And they are generally not indicated by distinct expressions. Now, very importantly, we need to understand is, as we said that causative events, they cause emotions. And the emotions, when a person goes through series of emotions, it can convert into mood. So emotion can convert into mood. And when we go into a state of a mood, like for example, irritability, we actually then are triggered by very small, small events and become more irritable. So the emotional outbursts then tend to occur more frequently. So emotions can lead to mood and mood can also lead to emotions. So they, they have a bi-directional vicious cycle kind of a relationship here. And importantly, we see that you know mood is always tied to the cognitions. They say that mood will change our cognition and it is pervasive. It lasts for longer for days together and emotions are tied to actions. So this is a very good statement by given by one of the authors. So mood is tied to cognition and emotion is tied to uh, actions. So when we talk about, we come across any, uh, or we are assessing mood, we come across mood, we see that we have to ask two questions to assess or concerning the mood of the patient. First, is the patient suffering? Secondly, is this expression of the mood is inappropriate to the social setting? If we get any one answer to the these two general questions, then the person needs treatment or it needs to be addressed or evaluation. Very importantly is we have to actually assess mood in the context of the diathesis. That means the personality, uh, the, the underlying temperament, the, the constitution of the person. So that is why it is important that a person with dysthymia will easily break into depression or depressive mood. Or a person uh, with dysthymia, when we go into a, a kind of an upper pole, like an effective uh, heightening, which we'll discuss in the coming slides, maybe uh, you'll, the expression will not be very vivid. So you need to always evaluate mood in the context of the background diathesis. That is a very, very important point. That is why variability, the cultural variability, specifically in our, our cultures, there is so much variation, so much diversity. So it is very important that we should know uh, about that culture, the 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 and and then subsequently evaluate that abnormality. So when we talk about assessment of mood, effect will come to later on. 
very briefly we should again uh, assess with open ended questions and then go to close ended questions and this is this pertains to most of the mental status examination evaluation so like pichle kuch dino se aapka man mein jaaj kaisa rehta hai this is the hindi version question given in psc 9 and with this patient will start to open up maybe see the 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 issue is that evaluation of mood cannot happen very in a, in a brief interaction it has to be a throughout interaction with the patient when we go through the history the the physical examination the and subsequently mental status examination so the whole duration of the patient when we are in contact with we evaluate mood but still we ask about mood the question just because in order to actually rule out smiling and depression because patient might be hiding hiding the depressive emotion depressive mood behind a smiling mask so in order to actually tease out this mask depression uh, smiling depression now uh, in mental status reports you know it's always a good practice to write in when we assess about mood patient's own words they say like patients are feeling on the edge or on the top of the world or rather than actually giving an impression so it it is always uh, uh it is always uh, preferable now when we see uh, mood so we see that mood is more subjective and when we talk about effect effect is more objective but still many authors have actually given uh, now various uh, various headlines in which mood has to be described i think i have just put it for the just uh, sake of continuity we don't do it with mood we do with effect which we will be discussing in the effect so we'll skipping here a question for everyone which phenomena what do you call that phenomena where patient finds it difficult to put his emotions into words can anyone can anyone uh, share so alexithymia so that is alexithymia fine so uh, now coming to effect so um, the image the the Uh, main context of this presentation so when we talk about effect effect means short lived emotion and it is defined as a patient's present emotional responsiveness as per casey and kelly that is fish psychopathology so it's defined as patient's present emotional responsiveness when we talk about sims it says that it refers to expression of emotion as judged by external manifestations that are associated with specific feelings for example laughter crying and fearful appearance so a little complicated definition which sims has given so uh, when we uh, when we talk about uh, the other authors how they have described effect so they have said the effect are focused and intentional when we talked about mood mood was not intentional mood was not focused and effect is here understood in phenomenological sense as directed towards an object and when we talked about mood mood was not directed towards any object so effect is directly towards object because when we assess effect so effect is generally directed towards our assessment so it also very plainly it refers to display of emotions so when emotions are displayed that is effect so i think that that is a very catchy definition our explanation a very simple explanation of effect so when we talk about effect how it can be assessed so when patient comes to us how we could assess the effect can anyone contribute i think it's a group discussion and it is not healthy that only i shall speak yes uh, residents can please tell how they assess effect anyone can unmute and share uh good morning sir sir during the interview only when we are interviewing the patient uh, we get to know about the basic and uh, uh, sir after that we can make and uh, we can give different situations to the patient we can like uh, if the patient is of depression and if the patient is talking about uh something that is very sad going on and if we try to change the topic or uh, or uh, like towards a more lighter thing or or a joke so we will check how the patient reacts to that or that could be how correct correct yes you are you are there so so basically we see when we talk about assessment of effect so dr bantas was trying to 
tell us that how we will instill those effective reactions in the patient. So we assess it when those reactions will come with autonomic responses, like the sweating, the tremulousness, if there is an anxiety, or the any, any or when we see the speech, the intonations, then the inflections of the speech, the tone, the tone of the speech, the volume of the speech. So when we say a manic patient will come up, so the the intensity, the tone, the volume will go up. You know, the, the pitch will vary with the gender and body movements, postures, gesturing will increase in, when we talk about many, many patients. And when we talk about depressive patients, the gesturing will reduce, the peripheral movements will reduce. So in effective expression, uh, the, the facial expressions, so effective ex effect is assessed by holistically looking at all of these possibilities. So, but we on if we say effect is assessed only by the help of facial expressions, it is inadequate. It will it might be inadequate. So we have to see, a holistic expression has to be assessed in effect. This is as per Tasman. So coming to each and every single domain of the effect, first is quality of the effect. So how effect actually looks like? How what is what is the quality of the effect? So anxious effect is feeling of apprehension of being apprehensive. And it's an unpleasant affective state and with the expectation of something untoward happening. So this is an anxious effect. Irritable effect is a state of poor control over aggressive impulses directed towards others, generally near and dear ones, and it would resolve in some, some time. So this is irritable effect or definition of irritability, which is ex at times asked. Sad or depressed is emotional mood tending towards sorrow relative passivity and diminished muscular tone with weeping. Elevated effect. So elevated effect is exaggerated sense of well-being out of keeping with subjects life situation. So this is elevated effect and with, which is exaggerated sense of well-being. Euphoric effect we all know it's morbid sense of cheerfulness and with exaggerated sense of or, or, or inflated self of psychological well-being and uh, you know in the, the third, the second line is important. This one, the lack of response to depressing influence so that everything is seen in best possible light. So this would actually dif differentiate something uh, like from uh, a casual cheerfulness. So, or a mood expansiveness. So, uh, so cheerful, the euphoria, they will not be able to be able to influence with any depressive influence. Elation, elation we say is euphoria plus you know, disinhibited behavior or an and overactivity. So psychomotor activity would increase in elation. So elation is euphoria plus increased psychomotor activity. Exaltation is uh, when grandeur will come up. So elation plus grandeur is exaltation. Ecstasy is, you know, the, the uh, intense sense of rapture and blissfulness. So that is, uh, so when the, the patient is in bliss, and uh, there is an intense sense of rapture, a deep mystic experience patient is having. So this is, they say that this is a pinnacle of an heightened mood state. Expansiveness, we can say lack of restraint in expressing feelings. So we can see a patient going in prodrome of mania. So can be having expansive mood. Expansiveness can precede uh, something like euphoria. But in euphoria, we said that there is a morbid sense of cheerfulness with inflated self of well-being. Euthymia is mood in normal range, implying absence of depressed or elated mood. So euthymia we can use in uh, to actually uh, quantify a normal mood. But generally, some people say that it has to be used in only in context of mood disorders. So I think uh, uh, if any difference of opinion is there, we can share that. Important effect is perplexed. So, and it is asked in exams actually. So what is a perplex effect? Perplex effect is refers to the experience of being unable to grasp, register or comprehend the contextually relevant meaning. And very important this questioning look. So we can see that when we see the perplex effect, so we can uh, gauge this questioning look. Then there is something known as dysphoric effect. So dysphoric is a combination of depression, anxiety uh, or, or irritability, any two. So that is a dysphoric effect. Coming from quality to intensity, intensity is the strength of emotional expression, the, the depth of emotional expression. 
So it is either the intensity is heightened, exaggerated or limited. So when we talk about limited intensity, we talk about shallow effect when there is a lack of depth in emotion, which we find in schizophrenia patients. So the emotional expression, the intensity we are not able to gauge, the intensity we are able to gauge the strength of emotional expression again by our interview and with the help of gestures, the voice, the facial expression, everything we have mentioned before. And when we talk about blunted effect, it is greatly diminished emotional responsiveness or expressionless, expressionless face and a uniform voice irrespective of the topic of conversation and patient is indifferent to distressing topics. So here we can see we, uh, blunted effect we see in Parkinson's. We also see in patients who have extraverbal side effects. So there is a facial masking and we can see that is a very greatly diminished emotional responsiveness. And flat effect is absolutely no effect is displayed, absolutely flat. So this is the something, some again we find in Parkinson's or maybe when someone goes into uh, uh, advanced dementias, we can, we can find these kind of cases. Now important is when effective intensity is normal, we need not mention it, that the intensity is normal. So there is no notation required in those cases. Coming to mobility of effect, then we have gone from quality, then intensity, then coming to mobility. So mobility is ease, the ease and speed with which transition from one type of emotion to another type of emotion. So transition from maybe a, a sad emotion to an irritable emotion to an uh, expansive or elated, uh, elevated emotion. So how ease and how with how much of speed we are moving from it. If it is a normal in context of normal individuals, so it is a normal mo mobility. Mobility, and thus we say that effect is mobile. So, but if it is reduced, we say it is constricted, constricted effect. And if when the effect is extremely constricted to one emotion, then we say it is fixed effect. Labile effect is very importantly pathologically increased mobility of effect is referred to as labile, marked by a rapid shift from one type to another emotion. Now, this is important without persistence of any one effect. So maybe if we are assessing effect and patient is in uh, a depressive mode from mature to the interview and then subsequently patient moves into something, uh, into an another pole or an elevated uh, mode. So we won't call it labile effect because none of the emotions should dominate it. Maybe patient became reactive and displayed another emotion. Maybe the mobility was normal. So we won't say that it, then it, it, it will be a labile effect. Labile effect will only say when there is no persistence of any one particular effect is there. So and patient is you know, shifting rapidly from one emotion to another. So uh, uh, then, then, then uh, the extreme version of mobility is effective incontinence where patient will absolutely lose control over their emotions. And it is like a urine incontinence, they lose their control and will burst into laughter or cry. It was also no, termed as forced weeping and forced laughing. It is seen in uh, organic cases like PSP and all. Now coming from quality, intensity, mobility to communicability. Communicability is ability of expression of effect to communicate to another one. So it is, it is, it is, it is uh, explainable that when we are able to uh, uh, judge that uh, the, what emotion patient is going through, uh, so and it, it it communicates to us, then communicability is present. Then very important, and I think it is discussed and little con uh, there are a lot of uh, confusions around this appropriateness. So appropriateness, it is congruence or fit between expressed quality of emotion and content of speech, thought, and expected degree of intensity and overall situation. So when we see appropriateness, we use appropriateness and congruence synonymously now. And we say that the, the, the emotion is in sync with our thoughts. Thoughts means speech and overall situation. So, so, so if they are in together, we say it is appropriate So or inappropriate. Then coming from appropriateness to range. So when we say range, range is what? Range is variety of emotional expressions. How many emotional expressions patient has shown in during one mental status examination or interview? 
So when we say full range, that is patient who expresses every emotion, many emotions depending upon the context and have a full or broad range of effect. Dr. Mantazo is probably trying to point, point out here that uh, when we give situations, different situations to the patient, patient will show different range of emotions. And when we say it is a restricted range, patient would show only a limited or fixed emotion or limited range. So a lower pole patient uh, throughout the interview has uh, shown an uh, emotion of depression. So we'd say that the, uh, the quality is depressed and range is restricted. When we talk about reactivity, we instill reactivity by giving extreme uh, different situations to the patient. And that is what it is known as extent to which effective change is in response to environmental stimuli. So patient does not respond to examiner's provocation in the form of joking. For instance, the effect is said to be non-reactive. So this is an example. So this is a summary table. It was given in a book of general psycho, uh, in psychopathology by Dr. Case and Simlai. So these are the non normal terms which we use. And these are the abnormal terms. Maybe a summary of whatever we have presented. So that is how it is. Important is we note, you know, abnormalities notation is more important than notations on normal features. So that is what something the residents have to be uh, clear about. Now important is giggling. We see a silly smile or giggling kind of a phenomenon in many patients. Now there can be various reasons. That, that is why I put it here. First of all, if there is, it is present for no reason. We generally find it in schizophrenia patients. And it is also known as fatuous effect. It can be in response to hallucinatory voices. So then it becomes appropriate, appropriate to the thought content. So, uh, or, or, or to the perceptual phenomena. So if it is for no reason, then it becomes inappropriate. So giggling becomes inappropriate, hallucinatory voices becomes appropriate. You know, it can be a defined strategy in adolescence you know, in colleges, which we do. So that is why it can be present in normal individuals also. And you know, a lot of patients, they come here, we, you know, smile for no reason. And then subsequently we evaluate and they, and it becomes embarrassing for us. We evaluate many of them. They turn out to be having GAD or OCD. So it can be you know, in an effort to, to control their own anxiety, giggling can be there. And cannabis intoxication, they giggle for uh, understood reasons. Now coming to various exp two expressions I have put up, which are very highly uh, quoted. So anyone can answer this. So this is an actor who actually gave both the expressions. So we can see this and we can see this, it's though not very clear with the picture. So this. So this is an omega sign. Okay, and this is because of the contraction of corrugator supercilia muscle. And Gray's Anatomy, it has written, it is written that it is a muscle of suffering. So corrugator supercilia it contracts, it withdraws his eyebrows medially, and there are vertical folds, and it mixes with this horizontal ranking, and this turns out to be an omega sign. Fine. And this is a long face sign. This is a long face sign. One more sign, long face sign, where you can see this angle of mouth and the uh, the 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 lateral part of the eye, these eyelids, lateral corner, we can see there is the, the distance becomes longer because of depression of the depression of this angle of mouth because of non-functioning of or less functioning of zygomaticus major and minor. So then the distance becomes larger. So it can give us just subtle clues uh, where where we can actually. Uh, see and diagnose depression at times can be very, very difficult to di differentiate depression, negative symptoms, in schizophrenia. These can help us in giving subtle signs. Now, whether this omega sign with this vertical fold is specific for depression? No, because you know, Parkinson's also you'll find it. It is known as procerus sign. So it is not very specific, but it has to be taken in the whole context of our evaluation. Now, this is Viragut sign. So, you know, very difficult. It is written, but actually it is difficult to comprehend how it looks like. So I got this from Facebook, this picture. So we can see this is a normal eyes. And when Viragut is, this is the medial canthus and this triangular shape phenomena is Viragut sign where it you know moves up from the lateral part of the eye 
and it goes up and it, it and this this triangular version is known as viragut sign so viragut sign with this omega sign these are highly suggestive of depression so i there i would end my presentation and i'm open to uh, i'll hand over the session to the chairperson thank you dr shobit thank you all the all the points for assessment of uh, affect they have been clearly i think uh, described uh, for the benefit of all the listeners and uh, so very important uh, point most uh, discussed i think uh, point on the mental status during case conferences their their most detailed discussion if have happened been on the effect of the patient when we are trying to assess for mood disorders so uh, residents if you have any queries regarding this where you would like to know more uh, you can please uh, ask all the participants uh, who want to know more about this subject uh, we can take a few queries anyone uh what are the difficulties you people face when you are actually uh, making notes of affect so if anybody can um, can ask any query no so anyway we are around if <laughs> you you people have any questions you can always uh, come to us um uh, affect uh, is one of the most difficult areas to uh, notate one of the things that happens during the assessment of affect is uh, that the interviewer's own feelings and own affect so that also plays a part so that is why as dr shobhit has clearly said that you should put it in writing or say in the uh, starting of his presentation also where the written description by that person was there so it is for everyone to judge so instead of just uh, you know Uh, writing the affect if you write the description then it will be better other people can also make their own interpretation because at times if the <laughs> there is a problem of counter transference or if there is uh, interviewer's own own emotions also play a part in how you are interpreting the effect so it is always better to note down the exact thing that you have observed or on which you are making the interpretation so that other people can also judge one of the most debatable point uh, i think one of the others is delusions or uh, like how whether they are present or not but uh, this affect is one thing that uh, happens uh, uh, like if there are difference of opinion on this this is one of the areas so if you put that uh, uh, notation that will i think help in your examination also you can say what is the reason why you are making this uh, this marking so thank you dr shobhit thank you very much for uh, a very you can say uh, in depth presentation and from various sources it was uh, it covered all the uh, points of effect i think it will clear doubts of residents who sometimes mix up in the various uh, subheadings so i think if there are no queries so your final comment please uh, thank you sir uh... i think this is very important because definitely we have a lot of confusion in putting up where and how and why so which we we are more assured when we actually go through first year to second year to third year and then when we gain experience we know how to put up things here just 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 final comment is see we have to actually come into the quality and you have to see whether when we are able to appreciate the quality communicability is there then we comment on the intensity and range reactivity everything becomes part of subsequently evaluating or teasing out emotions so if the effect is not communicable then generally we don't comment on the quality because how we can appreciate the quality if the the communicability is not there so and and these kind of an then phenomena goes towards non affective disorders in context of schizophrenia and when you are not able to appreciate the quality it is non communicable then we say that it's a shallow effect so these are some things few things which can help you to subsequently design and i would request 
as sir said please write effect in detail in your uh, daily presentations you can actually afford to commit errors here and then you can actually tell us or discuss with the uh, the the, the, the teach your teachers about the detail effect uh, details which you give and if there are some errors this can be refined because if you don't commit errors now how they you will be able to refine those so that is very important thank you thank you thank you and uh, uh, so i think that this uh, i think conclude the session so thank you everyone thank you sir thank you